to see at the beginning of the UFC Fight Night event in Fresno, the great Frank Trigg as a referee, the first man in UFC history to fight for a UFC title and then referee a UFC fight. Amazing stuff. I'd even know that he was training to become a referee, let alone was clear to become one, had passed all the tests, was an official for the California State Athletic Commission and was actually tapped to ref the event in, in Fresno this past weekend. Uh, an amazing surprise. It warmed my heart, and I wanted to talk to Frank Trigg about it, so he's kind enough to be joining us via the magic of Skype right now. There he is, the great Frank Trigg, joining us on Skype with crystal clear connection. How about that? Frank, how are you? Yeah, welcome to L.A. I guess the uh, the Wi-Fi here is better. <laughs> yeah, it's phenomenal. Um, all right, well, we have a lot to talk about, Frank. Uh, so there you are. We're, we're, we're watching the early fights, and you're there. You're wearing the the, the black shirt. You got the gloves on. Here we go. You're refing a UFC event. How did this come about? Um, well, the, the normal, the normal pattern, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> well, how much time we got? Cause this is, this is a little bit of a lengthy story. <laughs> go, go, all, go as long as you want, my man. <clears throat> okay. So four years ago, I am literally just bitching about how bad the refereeing is. I, I'm complaining about it all over the place. I'm seeing friends of mine literally having to almost like um, not kill. I don't want to say that because it puts a bad number on our, on our, on our, uh, sport, but definitely we're having to go two, three, four punches a lot further than they had to, to end the fight, or we're getting hit by two or three more hard, significant punches than they needed. Um, and it was like, it was disheartening. So I kept complaining. I kept complaining. Um, I did a couple of interviews one week, um, about it. Like how the roughing was just really bad. And, was, and the UFC at the time also was trying to increase the, the, the judging and fix the refing. And then I got a phone call from John McCarthy. He's like, look, if you think it's so easy, come do it. Now, mind you, when I was commentating for pride, um, Joe Ferraro up in Canada said, you should go take John McCarthy's, uh, command course as a referee to judge. Cause then when you're commentating, you'll actually know what their, their, uh, refs and judges are looking at. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take this course. Uh, but I'm going to kill it, man. I'm, I'm a fighter. Like I know all the rules and all the regulations. I'm going to kill this thing. So I go and take this course, um, fail miserably, but I'm not trying huh. to be a judge or a ref. I'm just taking it to be a better commentator. And I fail oh. miserably. Like I'm not even close. Okay. So go for a couple more years. And John's like, come and take the course this time for real to be a ref or a judge. At that point, I'd be doing amateur in Nevada. Um, at the time was, uh, ISKA, uh, with Ralph cook. Uh, and then it's, it switched to, uh, um, IMAF and UMAF, that whole organization kind of took things over. But, uh, so I was doing a couple of amateur bouts, went in, took John's command course and failed again and took it seriously. We, like studied for it, got ready for it, went in there and failed again. Uh, John's course is extremely hard. And if you want to be a referee, you want to be a judge, you got to take the course. That's, that's, you have to take one of these courses to get qualified. So in the state of California, they have, um, camo, which is the amateur organization that handles all amateur fights, but to go to work for, for camo in the state of California, you have to pass either John or Herb Dean's course. I passed John. So, so I failed John's course. Then I have six weeks of privates with him. So I'm living in Nevada, driving down to his old gym in, in Valencia once a week to do a two hour private with him of how to be a judge and how to be a ref in MMA. Huh. So I'm driving back and forth this whole time doing, doing this, doing this thing. Cause I, cause now I'm like, I'm, I'm in, man, I, I am in, I'm going to figure this thing out. So I finally get the blessing, uh, six weeks into it. And I start, I start refing for, for, uh, uh, camo to be able to be a pro in California licensed pro. You have to have a hundred bouts in amateur or be a pro licensed in another state. I have no refing experience. So I got to get my hundred bouts in with California in 10 months. I pull off a hundred bouts because wow. of my schedule. I don't have a regular nine to five job. I'm able to work Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every weekend. When I, when I don't have my kids, I'm able to go ref and I ref Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every amateur event that I get my hands on from LA down to San Diego in the state of California while refing amateurs like tough enough and, and uh, real water uh, promotions in Nevada at the same time. So I am refing all the time, you know, and, and, and I am, and at the amateur level there, it is, it is, uh, amazing to see, like you, you see a guy fight, you know, and you're like, wow, this guy's going to be, when he makes pro, he's going to be solid. Like this is going to be a great fighter when he makes the jump. And so I'm getting to see these guys in the cage. I'm learning my craft. I, I am getting schooled every time I step out of the cage. Every time I step out of the cage, I made a mistake. Every time I step out of the cage, there's something I got to improve on. Every time I step out of the cage, there's, there's something that I did. It didn't cause any, any more damage. Didn't cause any more injury to the fighters. 
wrong position, wrong placement, was in the camera, was like, there's all these things you have to think about when you're in as a ref. So get my 100 in, ask Andy Foster if I if it's okay for me to apply. If I apply, will he accept, accept it and, and give me my license? He says, yes, I apply, I get my license. I get no assignments for a year. What? One year I am I, I'm sat down for a year. So I'm still doing amateurs, but I have no no uh, uh, no pro bouts in California. But I am licensed pro in Hawaii, so I'm doing Hawaii bouts, and it's progressing. Now, um, be- no, no. That was a great story. I knew I jinxed it when I, I knew I jinxed it when I talked about his Wi-Fi connection. I knew I jinxed it. It was so crystal clear, and then I knew I jinxed it. Why did I say that? It's all my fault. It's all my fault. That's a great story. Usually with these things, like you kind of hear about them as they're as as they're happening, as they're percolating. Is he back? Is Frank back? Frank, I I'm think here. I jinxed it. I it? jinxed it. I jinxed it when I talked about your Wi Fi. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's your it's your fault. Where'd I lose you? Where'd <laughs> okay, I lose you? Uh so 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 you didn't get a call for a year from Andy Foster. Yeah, yeah. And so what happened is that Andy thought, like, like responsibly, he thought I was just doing it just to say that I was a pro referee, but really didn't want to be a pro referee. Huh. So I talked to him and said, no, I really want to do this thing. Like I'm, I'm really in this. Like I want to, I want to participate in the sport. I want to help improve the sport. I want to be, you know, I want to get to the point where, where fighters aren't worrying about the third guy in the booth, They're not worrying about the three judges sitting on the outside. They're out there doing their jobs, doing their tasks. And they know whether they, whether they win or lose is not because there's a screw job someplace. It's because everything is above board. And that's what I wanted to do. And, and, and he's like, okay, this is what the state of California is all about. We're going to, we're definitely going to, going to start using you. And they, I'm on the, the beginning cards of all these small, um, local pro events. I'm doing like the first Friday of the night or the, or the third Friday of the night. And that's my night. And the rest of the time I'm doing the, the pat downs or I'm picking up scorecards and you're learning, you know, it's like going into a restaurant and, and your dad owns the restaurant and you think you're going to be in there and you're going to be the, the manager. And he's like, no, you're in the back sweeping the floor and doing dishes. And that's what I was doing. I was doing dishes. I was learning. And, and it, it took a long time. It was a lot of fights and I'm kind of lucky because I talked to John McCarthy at least twice a week. If, if I'm not, if I'm not refing and if I'm refing, it'll be three or four times a week about different things I've seen in other fights, different things I see with other refs, different things, just to improve the task, improve my, my game. So uh, I've done a, I did a bell tour, uh, when Tito fought Chael at the forum, I was on that card, but I was on the undercard. I was, I was on the dark, the, the off TV stuff, you know, the, the dark fights, which is where I belong. If you look at the hierarchy of the guys that are there that night was McCarthy um, I believe it was uh, Beltran, Herzog, Mike Bell, and myself with the five refs. Where do you belong in that hierarchy? I belong at the bottom. That's where I belong. So that's where I was, and and I'm totally okay with that. I am just going. I'm working, just working, 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 and then I get text from Andy Foster like two months ago. He's like, "Hey, I just gave you a new assignment. Check the app and see if you want to accept it." And it was the UFC fight for wow. December nine. And so it's it's the equivalent of being called up from triple a baseball to the majors and you're going to play for the Yankees. You're not, you're not going, you're not getting called up and, and going and gonna to play for, you know, some random Baltimore Oriole team. You're jumping up again, playing for the Yankees. It was a huge deal. And it took a couple of days. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, man. It took a couple of days for me to like really have to sit down. I had to calm myself down and think about like, this is, this is now coming. This is what you wanted. This is what you asked for. Now you're getting it. You better, you better, in, and you better have your stuff together, man, <laughs> or it's gonna, it's gonna be. So I, I, I went out and I asked for a lot more other minor assignments in, uh, some amateur and some other pro events to make sure I was up to task. And December 9th came and went and, and, uh, I, you know, uh, uh, I still get, I still get, uh, talked to after every fight. Um, I still have, uh, uh, some things we have to prove on, but what's interesting, what most people don't know, I asked McCarthy a while ago, I said, Hey, what was, I want to look at the fight that was your best refereeing fight. The fight you, that is perfect, that you were perfect in. Because I want to mimic that style and mimic what you do and what you did. And he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't have one. Like, what do you mean you don't have one? Like, you can't think of one? Like, no, no, there isn't one that I was perfect. He goes, I am still constantly improving. But So, Ariel, I need you to take a leap with me here. Take the leap that John McCarthy is the best referee in MMA in the world. Take, take that leap with me. If we just get to that leap, then, okay, he's the best guy in the world. The best guy in the world is telling you, Every day I'm still working on this task. Every day I'm still working on this crap. Every day I'm still trying to improve myself. You're like, man, this learning curve is never going to end. There's always going to be something I got to figure out. 
And there were there were a few things that I did on uh, on uh, Saturday that that I need to improve on. And there's a couple of things that uh, uh, I got to do a little bit quicker. I got it done, but it was it wasn't fast. Like talking to the head table and doing some other things that you have some other tasks you have to do outside the cage. But it was a uh, it was a, a great event. It was a great night, and you know it's just one of many. But I, I do need to correct you. I am not the first. Uh, Dan Severn is the first. Ah, but he did it when there's no commissions. There's okay. no commissions. I'm the first to do it under the new commissions. And who fought and for a belt and refereed? State of California. Can, yes. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. And, Fair enough. And it's uh, but I I am the first to do it. Fight for the belt. Be a referee at the time of refereeing. I'm in the Hall of Fame as well. So that's the first that I've gotten. But it doesn't matter. It, it, all that is is random arbitrary stuff. It really doesn't make a difference. No, but it's very cool. Now let me ask you this: Were you nervous? Were you nervous in there? So, um, it's funny, you were just talking about GSP and I, and when he said this line years ago, I kind of used it as like, yeah, we always have butterflies, but you're trying to get those butterflies to get into a formation yeah. and fly to your mouth in a, in a perfect formation. I still get the same. I still get nervous when I'm walking to the cage. I still do. I still get, you know, you walk in there and you're like, man, this, this is okay. I'm here for fighter safety. I'm here to make sure these guys get out of here with, with the, the, the least amount of damage air quotes possible so that they can go on and fight again later, whether they win or lose. And it does make you a little nervous because you, you do have to watch out. And there's a lot of things you got to look for. So absolutely, I was nervous. But you have to you know control it and, and do your job and do your job the best way that you can. Compare compare those those feelings, those emotions to your UFC debut. You talk about like getting called up to the Yankees. The UFC is still the UFC. Maybe it's a little bigger now, a lot bigger. If you hmm? if, 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 if you want to say bigger. that, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but it was still the UFC back then. Did, did you feel this? How, how would you compare hmm? those two emotions? Uh, fighting for me, uh, and, and refing are two totally different concepts in my, in my brain and the way I, and the way I, I approach it. Uh, but the feelings are the same. The nervousness you get, you know, people, you know, my, my younger brother, when he was in law school, would get nervous before tests. It's the same nerves, it's the same feeling. Like you get that same, uh, uh, upset stomach and kind of shaky legs. And, and you go over like, did I do enough? Did I practice enough? Did I do enough stuff? But with this, with this, uh, it, it's when fighting, it's selfish. I have to do everything I possibly can to make sure I'm beating your ass. That's what I have to do. Whatever it takes for me to get to that point where I am dominating you, that's what I have to do as a fighter. As a referee, it's selfless. I am not in there for me. I'm not in there to let people know, oh, look, look, you know, how's this big deal? What, does, what is this big thing? Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in here refereeing for the UFC. It has nothing to do with that. It's all about making sure those guys are taken care of. And that's been my approach. Which is the reason why a lot of people don't know I ref. I don't publicize it. I don't post it. I don't put my scorecards up. I don't, you know, lay out my my bout sheets. I don't do any of that stuff. I just go in. I do my job. I go have a, a drink with the, the guys after the fights are over, and I leave. And that's just what I do. Yeah, I feel like I have my fingers. I mean, kind of on the pulse. I had no idea that you were even involved in yeah. any of this. That's why that when I saw it, I was like, "Holy crap!" There's, I mean, and that's what was so impressive <laughs> about it because I know it takes work to get to the UFC, you know, to be refing UFC events yeah. that Andy Foster of all people was maybe the most respected um, commissioner to allow you to do that. I didn't realize it, it was that kind of road. And so for you to never publicize it yeah. at any point is pretty darn impressive on your part. Well done. Well, well, thank you. But don't, don't remember my, my original reason for coming in is because of the, the, the fighter safety, like I'm worrying about guys that, that are competing. And one of the things I saw with a lot of the refs that were screwing up we're so busy trying to tell the world that they had the main event. They're so busy telling the world I had the championship fight in the co-main event. They were forgetting why they were originally there. And so I just took a whole turn and said, look, man, I got to, this is just one part of my life. And, and, and those, those people that really know me, there's a lot of parts of my life now that I've pulled completely out of the, the limelight. I'm keeping everything quiet. There's certain things in my life. I just keep really quiet. Now I don't talk about them at all. I keep it to myself and refing is one of those things. And, <clears throat> when the, the hardest thing for me, honestly, was waking up the next morning and and after the UFC had put the tweet out that I was in the cage as one of the refs, now having to look at all those notifications of of everyone saying congratulations, great job, and all that stuff, for me, that's that was the hardest thing, was now I, the world knows I'm refing and I was trying to keep it quiet. I was trying to keep it off the radar, but now it's, it's, it's on the radar and now I have to deal with that. It's a different thing now. Oh, wow. I was actually just about to ask you, what was it like to see, you know, the response and, and everyone's so happy to see you in there. Well, and, and it sounds like you didn't really like it. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't the fact that I didn't like it. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. Ron McCarthy was one of the judges. Uh, uh, he comes up and goes, Hey, look, the UFC tweeted you. 
I'm like, what? Come on, man. The UFC didn't tweet me. Just stop, right? It's like maybe I'm thinking somebody else tweeted at the UFC and I yeah, was attached yeah, yeah. into that, that right. tweet. But I know it came right from the UFC and I was like, I got a game of chicken skin. Now, mind you, Ron, bless his heart, knows how I am. Once I go into the cage, whatever event I'm working, once I go in the cage, my phone goes in the bag and I do not look at my phone until I am done refing. Once I'm done refing, I can get back on and look at in between fights, in between stuff when I'm off. I look at my social media and, and, and you know, post pics of other people refing and doing stuff like that. So Ron waited till I was done. He goes, hey, look, the UFC tweeted you and it gave me, it gave me goosebumps. Wow. I was, I was like, this is like, this is surreal. This is a huge deal. It's a huge deal for me. I couldn't, I couldn't, when I, <clears throat> so let, let's step back to when I have to go back into the, the, the pre-fight with the guys in the locker room for the first fight. Yeah. I'm doing all that. I'm running around. I, I'm trying to make sure I'm going through my head, my checklist, everything I have to get done. I do my pre-fight, do my checklist in the pre-fight, do everything, get everything ready, get my, my, uh, um, uh, all my stuff set up where my, I know where my gloves are at. I know where my bag is at with my water in it. So I know I can get right to it and not have to be searching for stuff. I get inside the cage and I, and I do my walkthrough in the cage right before the, the first fight starts. I do all this whenever I fight on the card, wherever I ref on the card, I don't care from the first fight, or the fifth fight. When I, when I finally step in there for my first official duty, I walk the cage. When I walked in and walked the cage, I looked up and I realized the Monster Energy Drink <clears throat> logo was in the center of the canvas. And it hit me right then that I'm here. I, I'm really inside this cage and I'm wearing all black. I'm not in a pair of shorts. I'm not wearing fight gloves. I don't have a jock on. I don't have a cup on. I don't have a mouthpiece in. I'm wearing all black. And, it's, and it was, it was, it took me a second. Like I had to go, okay, uh, take a breath. Go through your checklist again. Let's get started. And then the announcement started coming in for the first fighter to make his walk. And then we just went and did our, and did our stuff. So then when Ron gave me that, now all those emotions start cracking into me at one time. And I had chicken skin for like 15 uh -huh. minutes. I'm walking around like on a, on a, it was, it was, it was cool as crap, man. But wake up the next morning. It wasn't that I didn't like it. It was me always waiting. Okay. This, oh, this congratulations. Okay, great. The next one's going to be the one. Oh, congratulations. Okay. That one. Okay. That's it. The next one's going to be the one. Cause you're waiting on that. Cause I, I'm an alpha male. I, 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 I put myself on top. I train myself to be the best at whatever I do. I don't care what it is in my life. I'm always trying to be that top guy. But the only thing you ever remember is that one post of that one person says you did a bad job and that's what you do. Uh. You keep looking at, it, I'm like, it's coming. Coming, it's coming. And this has never came. It just never came. So it was pretty cool. But it was like, man, it was stressful. And I handle my own social media. So I have to answer everybody else back myself. So it takes a while, you know. Did you see Dana White backstage? So he was three chairs away from me. Um, but when I have a commission patch on, it's not really appropriate for me to, to talk to uh, uh, the promoter when the fight is going on. So I didn't say anything to him. And when the opportunity arose to say hi to him, after the fights were over, because he didn't show up until the main event started uh, or right okay. before the main event. So I was already done refing. The opportunity rose for me to say hi to him. The, the fans were bombarding him for pictures and autographs. And it was it was just wasn't appropriate for me to step in there and, and say and say anything to him. I would have absolutely said hi to him if the opportunity was correct, but I just didn't arise. Much respect. Uh, you, you you did it the right way. Um, what about Andy Foster? What did he say to you afterwards? So, um, Andy, uh, unfortunately was not at the event. Um, Mark, uh, Rhea ran the event as the lead inspector. And so Mark talked to me after I was said and done, gave me some pointers, Mike Beltran gave me my pointers. And then, um, uh, actually the first time I spoke with, with Andy was when you texted me, asked me to do your, to do your show. And I said, look, I, I, got, I it took me a while to answer you back as you know, yeah. because I had to get a hold of Andy to make sure it was, it was okay for me because there are legal issues. Now I, I technically, when you work for the commission, you work for the state. So there, there's governmental issues. I have to worry about what I can say, what I can't say, stuff like that. And he was like, hey, good job, man, John. When John gets back from Australia, he's going to look at the tape. He's going to give you some pointers. I have a meeting with John here in about uh, an hour from now. I get on the phone with John and we go through um, everything that I did and don't do or did or didn't do correctly and what I approved on and what I didn't approve on and, and all that good stuff. And then um, Andy was like, Every, everybody told me you did a great job. We're, we're super excited and we can't wait to do more stuff for you in the future. And the one thing I will say is that uh, the next the next Bellator card that's on uh, uh, January 20th, I've already been assigned that card. So I'll be working that, that next amazing. Bellator card as well. That's amazing. Can you make a living as, as an MMA referee? So uh, when, when, and I knew you're going to ask this question. So I actually had to talk to John a little bit about it to okay. make sure that I had my facts straight so I didn't get screwed up. So, that, so everybody understands how, how it works, whether I work the, the very first fight of the night on the undercard and the dark on the dark card, or I work the main event or I work the main fight of the main event. It's the same pay. Everyone gets the same pay. 
The only time the pay is different is if you have a championship fight in the main event. So obviously, like when John Jones and Cormier and those three fights all went off, then there's there's th- those three guys got got more pay because it's championship fights, as you should. But yeah. we all get paid the same amount, and we all get paid for the night. It's not per fight; it's per night. So it makes no difference. We all can work together and hustle together and take care of each other and and pay attention to each other when we're when we're there. So I talked to John when I first took John's course, the one I failed as a commentator. I, you know, I'm thinking John's rich. I see him on TV all the time. I think he's freaking loaded. And he gives, he breaks down the numbers for you in his class. So he tells you, these are the commissions. This is what we get paid. This is how it works. I was like, how are you surviving, man? Like, how are you, I have no idea how you live. I have no idea how you make it. I don't get it. Like, I don't understand anymore. And he's like, it's my, my LA cop retirement. That that's how I survive from being a police officer, my retirement money. That's what, that's how I'm surviving. We do not make that much money as refs. Somebody, somebody posted or tweeted to me and, I'm, and forgive me. I meant to, I want, want to look it up. Remember his name so I can mention it here. He's like, oh, it's sad to see that that Trick has to ref for a job. Man, it, it, it this is not a job. <laughs> You're not making. And my response was, hey, this is not a job. It's a passion, which it is for me. There's no money in it. I don't do this for the money. There's absolutely no money in this. Like we're not, none of us are in there. We're not. You don't see refs driving Lamborghinis. You don't see you know refs out there with big houses and 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 living living over by you know Dana and, and Lorenzo in Vegas. We're, we just go out there and we're passionate about this, about this game. So can you make a living? It's, it's a, it's a tough, how do you need to make a living, man? Like we can't live in New York. There's, I can't live in New York city. There, there's no way doing it. I live in New York city. Um, I, I would have a, you know, it would be very hard. Every referee that you, that you see that lives in LA, they all have full-time jobs. You know, all of them have super, super high level of full-time jobs and they're rough on the weekends. And they're, and when they have to travel, it's days, it's days off. It's vacation days. You have to take from the real job to go rep. So it's, this isn't, we're not doing this for the money. We do this because we love the sport. And me personally, because I want to give back to the sport that you know, I want to tell you that I made myself famous. I want to tell you that I did all my own hard work and I made this thing happen. UFC made me famous. They promoted me. They pushed me. This is what, this is how I got famous because the top dog in the MMA made me have a name at the time when they were trying to build themselves up and I have to give back. You have to, as an athlete, as a martial artist, you have to give back to the sport that you are in. It's what we do in, in judo. You can't get the top, the best, the top belt, the best, uh, the top rank belt system without being a coach. You have to teach and give back. This is my way to give back to the sport. Uh, and, and I do it cause I love it. And I feel bad for, for Jill and my wife. Cause whole time we first started dating Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we're running all over Nevada yeah. and California reffing. And she's at, that's what we do on the weekends. Everybody else is at the clubs and hang out at the bars and we're at fights, watching sweaty guys punch each other. And that's what we're doing. So, so your, your full-time job now is you're, you're still an actor, correct? Stunt work. Well, well, it's so I want to tell you that uh, most of my money comes from acting, but uh, the reality of it is that uh, stunt work. Okay. It's uh, uh, the most amount of most amount of work I do is stunt work now. Um, like I'm working on SWAT, the CBS show, uh, tomorrow again. I'm dubbing another actor. Uh, be my third episode with them. I had an episode that aired last week that everybody saw. Um, I have Lucifer again in a couple weeks before the Christmas break, and I just died on Lucifer again. So my main gig right now is is stunt work, which allows me to always work on the weekends, you know, and, and I, and unfortunately I have to tell Andy, Hey, I'm hundred percent taking this, taking this, this gig that you gave me, I'm hundred percent taking the assignment. But if Hawaii five O calls, I might have to call out because it pays way more and it's right, residuals right. and it's retirement and I'm in SAG. So it's like, I got to do it, you know? And, and so for the record, how many fights do you think you reffed at this point? Oh, uh, my wife keeps great track of it, um, but she was in a car driving, so she couldn't give me the exact number. But it, I'm well over 500 bouts uh, wow. right now. That yeah. is amazing. And and uh, are you licensed to ref in Nevada as well? I am not, and I have not applied. I've not tried to apply. Um, uh, so I, I've I've been blessed. I, I can't lie. Uh, so John McCarthy is not only the, the guy that trained me to be a referee; he's also my mentor. So he, he, he talks to me all the time about these things and, and where I should go and what I should do. And I'm, you know, I'm anxious and you've known me for a long time, Ariel. I'm super hyperactive and I want stuff now. Like I want to do it now. So I keep, okay, let's, let's now let's do Nevada. Now let's do New York. Now let's do, you know, cause I'm from New York. I want it. There's a lot of, a lot of amateur fights up in Buff, up in Buffalo and in Rochester, my hometown. I want to go back and be able to represent up there. So I'm like, I want to go, I want to go. He's like, no, 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 slow down. I'm in California and, and, and people, people are going to, are going to roast me for this one, but California is the best commission that there is in the, in the country by far and away, the best, the best <laughs> Andy Foster sets all the new, the new weight cutting regulations. He helped progress the new, 
uh, uh, the new uh, uh, fingers and eye pokes and the new down opponent. Like that's all through state of California. And that's where I'm licensed. So I'm in the best I'm in the best commission in the country trying to overreach every day. I'm always trying to overreach to get I want to do more. I want to do more for the sport. I want to be out there more. And they're they're, you know, keep me in the barn and they're slowing me down. They're like, no, it's not. You're not ready to apply yet in Nevada. You're not ready to apply yet in, in New York. You're not ready yet to apply in these other places. <clears throat> and when, excuse me, when that actually happens, Andy will make the phone call to the, to the commissioner in those other states and ask them, hey, Trig would like to would like to apply in your in your uh, commission. Would you accept this application? If they say yes, what's the you know whatever it is like for Nevada, usually you have to fly in and do a and do a, a commission hearing, and they're going to talk to you about you know and look at your record and do all that stuff you know as a refereeing record and do all that stuff, and then and if they approve it, they approve. If they don't, you, you're just ass out. This is what it is. So right now, I am just licensed in California and licensed in the state of Hawaii to do uh, professionally, but I would. 100% go anywhere. If any organ, I don't care if it's um, Titan fighting championships, you know, called me up and was like, Hey, will you come to Florida and do this? And if Florida would license me, I would go on a ref in Florida. I'll go anywhere to ref that they will accept me, but I am not licensed in any place else, but I have not tried or put my application in for any place else because John and Andy and Mike Beltran and Mike Bell are doing a great job of kind of let's hold you back a little bit. Let's not get too big. Let's just slow down and, and give you some more, give you some more time in, in a controlled environment. They, they control me and they control what bouts I have and they control where I'm at and they control. And they're also, I work with the same team a lot. I'm always with Beltran, I'm always with Bell and uh, McCarthy. Usually on the bigger pro events, I get with McCarthy as well. So I have these guys that give me my conversations when I walk out of the cage that tell me what I did great, what I need a little bit of improvement on. And when you go to these other commissions, I wouldn't have that. <clears throat> and, and let's be honest, when when uh, uh, a normal referee, let's, let's, let's use that term, a normal referee minus, not take the big four or five out of it, but a normal referee makes a mistake. It's not that big of a deal, gets a couple of boos, gets a couple of things, nothing that big. <clears throat> because of me, the, the way I was as a fighter, the stuff I had to make up to sell fights when I fought Hughes, that, that, that moniker that came in, that other, the ultimate personality that I had to use then, that when I make a mistake, it will be detrimental. It will be a huge problem. And they're making sure that my mechanics are solid, that I cannot miss it. I don't miss a step. They're making sure that my reaction time is perfect. And so they're keeping me in control because they want to make sure that once I go to another another uh, uh, commission, that they will throw me up to the top level. They will throw me up that co-main event, main event, just because of my name and mm -hmm. being able to use, oh, UFC Hall of Fame with Frank Trigg is the third man in the boot. Like that's that's their, their thing. And so they're doing yeah. a good job of making sure that when I get there, that I am completely prepared and absolutely um, amazingly set for that particular thing. Like today, I've talked to, to Bell, Beltran, and McCarthy, and we'll talk to McCarthy again, completely separate about the same question I had for them about what I was doing in a, a particular part of one of the fights I ref. And they all had the exact same answer without conferring to each other. And wow. I knew the answer, but I want to make sure that they all have the same answer. And we do this for each other. Mike, you know, we'll talk to each other about, I talk to them about their stuff. We do this all the time, back and forth with, with ourselves, wow. just That's to improve amazing. upon our, our game. We have to. Of all the sports out there, I feel like MMA referees have the toughest job because it is just so subjective. You got to step in there. And yes, you have to do that in other sports as well. But I just feel like, you know, like even in your fight, I mean, you got, you have to know when to say when, and sometimes you could be late. Sometimes you could be early. There's a lot at stake. Do you now have a greater appreciation? Like if you think back to 25-year-old Frank Trigg and how he viewed MMA referees, do you now have a, a completely different appreciation for what these men and women go through? So, so I told Herb Dean when I was fighting, uh, um, I had Larry Landless for the, for the Dennis Hall fight part two um, at the WFA. And I told uh, Herb backstage that the problem right now is, is that not only do I have to fight my opponent, but I also have to fight the ref. I got to know what ref I have to figure out what's going on, you know? And, and then, uh, uh, now if, if I had taken a refereeing course and I, I tell us to, to, to every fighter that will listen to me, any manager, any corner guy, you need to take a refereeing and judging course. You need to take it because I was doing things I thought were illegal and trying to hide them from, from everybody. And they're like, no, it's, that's totally legal. It's, you're not, uh -huh. <laughs> we knew you're doing it. And I was doing, and I wasn't doing stuff that I thought was illegal. That was legal. I'm like, no, that's totally legal. You could, totally could have done that. 25 year old Frank Trigg, 26 year old Frank Trigg, not only being a punk, a little pompous ass, a little full of himself, besides all those things, 
had no effing clue what he was doing or what he was talking about. Refs have the absolute toughest job because if we are my, uh, uh, if we are one one hundredth of a, of a second too late, that's an extra huge hard punch coming in, and we're just and we're just like, you know, we have to be there. And not that you can ever be in the best position. You can't. There's movement. It's chaos, man. There's, there's things happening and people going different directions. You can't be in the right spot all the time. It's impossible. But you have to be in the best spot you can possibly be in at that particular time, that particular moment in time. And when we screw up, it's not that it's not not saying we screw up, but say we're it's perceived the fans perceive that there's a mess up, and the fact is that there wasn't a mess up. It was a hundred percent accurate. It was completely understandable what happened, but the fans don't know don't know the rules, don't know the regulations, don't know what's actually going on in there. Like they just don't get it because at home or even in the arena, if you can't see what happens, I I, I can't see. Oh, jumbotron! I'm looking at the jumbotron. That's the best view. The director in the truck is giving you the best view because that's what they're feeding feeding at home. So I see the best view. The the refs have a better view than that. <laughs> Our view is even better. So we know more of what's going on and what's happening. But when we get, we know if, if there's a mistake, refs do get picked on. It's un, it, it is unfair, but it is part of the sport. It is part of the game. And it's one of the things that makes me love MMA is that our fans – not only hold fighters to task. There were there were several fans there with with the the uh, um, um, well I, I won't get into it. But several fans there that had shirts on that were picking on particular other other fighters. Okay. They, the fans hold us to accountability. The the promoters hold us to accountability. But then we hold ourselves to accountability. The judges and refs, we hold ourselves, and then we still have to be accountable to the fans and the, and the promoters. Like we still have to understand that that hey, I I could have been. During the uh, during the Alexa Davis and uh, Liz Carmouche fight, I could have been two feet closer because I wanted to be in there closer to see what was going on, but I could have been three feet further away also. Which one is better? Well, you have to think about the promoter. There's a camera over my left shoulder, man. If I step in closer, I'm blocking that camera. No one at home can see what's going on. I'm blocking, I'm blocking the, the talent value. So now I have to step back out of the way, but how far away is too far away? I have to be let the folks at home be able to see what's going on, but I also have to be close enough to stop something when it's happening. So it's this this back and forth. And that's one example of what goes on, you know, where we all we we do have a tough job. You're right. We have an extremely tough job. But the people that are the best at it are the ones that have super thick skin, because we're gonna get booed, we're gonna get yelled at, we're gonna get picked on. It's just it, we have to have super thick skin. But we also I don't wanna say we don't care about the fans. We're not in it for the fans. We're not in it for the glory. We're not in it to be loved. We're not in it to be to be liked. And, and obviously, the, most of your listeners know my career. I was not cheered a lot when I was fighting. I was booed quite a bit. So I've got thick skin. It doesn't really bother me. I'm okay with that. So when I go in there and, I, and I'm in there for fighter safety, I'm just worrying about the fighters. If I get booed, I get booed. I'm okay with it. Stand him up, Trig. Stand him up. Tr- okay, well, that's not what's happening right now. I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Ref, you suck. It's- and you're not doing this job. I don't care what you think. Like. No disrespect to the fans, because I love our fans. I love sure, to do sure. some of the fights, but I'm there for the fight. I'm there for them, man. I'm not there for me. I'm not there for anybody else. I'm there for them. Uh, two last things. Any interest in judging? Uh, first of all, no, I'm not letting you go. I told you we're staying on it for two <laughs> hours, and that's what we're going to do. You have a uh, call with John. Uh, uh, it's, he'll trust me. He'll wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. he's going to yell at me for 35 minutes so wait and then we'll talk about guns and talk about a little bit of hunting and talk about shooting next time I guess and then that'll be the conversation uh, I am licensed to judge I do judge um, um, quite a bit uh, at the amateur level and I do judge sometimes um, so some of the pro events it does cost uh, for the folks at home that don't know this I think Earl you understand this that that there's a fee to, you have to pay to the commission to have judges and referees there and on the, the smaller uh, uh, MMA shows that are pro they may not have the income to be able to afford to have an extra judge or an extra ref show up. So we'll sometimes judge ref and then there'll be an extra seat, the third seat, the other, the rest will rotate. So you go from pit. Uh, usually it's, it's from pat down uh, uh, to refing to uh, judging to off. And that's kind of the rotation that happens uh, within the hierarchy. Sometimes it's changed up a little bit, but that's usually how it goes. And I do judge quite a bit, but it, it's, it's personally, I prefer refing. I find judging uh, uh, a little bit more difficult. I find judging a little bit more harder because you've only got that view from that one seat. You don't have the view that we all see at home. I can only and I can only score what I see. If I don't see it because it's on the other side of the cage or or your back is to me and I don't see what you're doing, then I, I can't score it because I didn't see it as a judge. Refing to me is a little bit easier, but my son disagrees. He he's he's going to start training to be a judge. 
uh, up in Rochester. And he's wow. like, he disagrees. He thinks judging is harder and that's what he wants to judge. So wow. it's just, it's just one of those things. Like it's effective, but I do want to judge boxing. I do want to get in a judge, boxing, but I have no desire to referee boxing. Huh? Why so is that? You know, Why do you want to judge just, boxing? Um, I, I like the way that boxing goes and, and then I see a problem. <laughs> I see a problem, yeah, you know, in yeah. some commissions, I see issues with the way they're judging. And, and I'm like, boxing is such a beautiful sport. It is such an incredible sport. And you, you see these kids that put their heart and soul into it. And these coaches that are, that are, their wrists are busted up and their elbows are broken from holding mitts for so long, for so many years and their shoulders barely, barely work anymore, but they're still struggling every day to get this one kid as junior welterweight WBO title. And they're still in there trying to help them out. And it's such a beautiful, it really is a martial art and it is so raw and it's so determined. And then to see some of these guys just get completely hosed down by bad judging. Yeah. It, it's, it hurts. It makes me, it makes me teary eyed. I see these guys and I don't know, I don't know the fighters. I have no relationship with any of the fighters. I don't hang out with any of these boxing fighters. But you look at me like, man, you're getting hosed by this judge. It's just, I just don't like it. And I'm like, and I, you know, I, and of course I run my mouth, you know, I don't have much Ariel, but I do have an opinion. Yeah. So I, I start talking about it and then I told like, then start judging in boxing too. So I think the next phase, um, right now, um, uh, we're in Hawaii, obviously Jill and I are in Hawaii. We make the move, uh, January 1st to LA permanently. And once I'm in LA permanently, um, and this is, this will be our new base of operation. I will, uh, 100% be looking into judging boxing. Now, will I have to start all over again at the amateur level? Will I have to, I don't know any of that. I don't know any of the requirements. I don't know. It's still a very early formulated plan. It may never come to fruition, but it's kind of the next thing that I would like to do wow. is, is to also, uh, uh, judge boxing and see where that goes. And I may not like it. I might get into it, but like, you know what? This is not for me. I'm going to get out. And if it's not for me, I refuse at 45 years old. I refuse to do anything that I do not wake up every morning and go, I can't wait to do this again. If it becomes a drag or a draw, I am gone. I'm not doing it. If I have any part of it. I don't want to be, be associated with it because it's going to get somebody hurt or get somebody screwed over. And I don't want to do that. By the way, your son who wants to be a judge in, in Rochester, how old is he? Uh, 24, actually. 20. Yeah. 24 and, uh, has my, uh, let's see, she's 22 months now. I think she turns two in two months. My granddaughter's uh, 22 months now. That's right. That's right. Congratulations. That's amazing. It's amazing that you're uh -huh. a grandfather. That, that kind Thank of Thank you. Yeah. Away. Oh, ball of fire. It's so, incredible. So uh, I talked to, uh, 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 and I apologize for this, this, this long rant that's about to come up. I was talking to uh, one of the doctors, um, and he asked me, how was the transition coming out of fighting, and how did you transition? What happened? And I went through all the, all the athlete depression and what am I going to do next? And where's my self identity and what am I going to have happen? And all that, I went through all that stuff when I, when I left the sport, uh, now six years ago, uh, and I never officially retired. I just stopped taking fights. I just like, I, I can make more money doing stunts. Cause at the time I was on the back end of my career. There was, there, I was not the big dog. There was not going to be any money in it for me. I can make more money doing stunts. So I'm gonna go do stunts. And that's what I'm going to do. I just stopped fighting. And I was like, I'm never going to find another passion. I got super lucky that I found roughing and stunt work that consume me every day. And they, they just, all I can think about every day is the next is, is how can I be a better ref? How can we be a better stunt guy? And then you're like, when you have children, you know, you know, this, when you have children, they are above everything. So think about the passion I have for refing. Think about the passion I have for stunt work. My kids crush that. They're not even, it's not even close. Okay. Like just watch them play baseball and watching them come home. But like, I got all A's and, and just watching all that is just amazing. Then my granddaughter was born and I was like full, man, they're, it's, it's, they're all on the same level. Now my kids and my granddaughter are all on the same level. I'm like, this is, it, it's incredible when you're, when your kids are born, what you're going to do. But the transition coming out of, out of, out of, uh, 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 fighting was really difficult, but my eldest son, man, he, he, God bless him. He got on the phone with me and we just started talking about next steps and what we're going to do and how we're both going to take over the world doing different things. And you know, how, where, where our lives will, will, uh, cross over without being father, son and all that kind of stuff. And it was, it, it just, he, he got me through that, got me through that whole mess. And then of course the, the, uh, the, uh, the younger kids, you know, watching them progress and grow and amazing little league baseball players and, and incredible gymnasts and doing all that. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible, you know, watching my, my daughter grow into a little, a little woman. It's just like, Oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. But yeah, it's, so I've been, I'm blessed, man. I'm lucky, man. I got the best commission. I'm working in the best state, uh, got the, the best granddaughter that any, any guy could ask for. 
uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Is my life, uh, uh, perfect, but hell no. Is it all, is it all great that you see on social media? Absolutely not, man. We got, we got days where things are dark and things are black and the whole, what, you know, where, where's, where's rent coming from? You know, some, sometimes we have that, we still have that question. Where, where's that? What do I got to do? What, how, what I got to make happen, make rent get here. And we still have that. We still have that sometimes it's not as often as it used to be, but it's still there. But man, I wake up every morning. I'm like, what am I really bitching about? <laughs> what am I really complaining about? I'm okay. But this will work out. We'll make, we'll make it happen. And it's, it's amazing, man. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's been great. Yeah. The, the last thing I just wanted to ask you was about a man who you'll always be connected to Matt Hughes. Have you had any contact with him yeah. since his accident? Have you spoken to him? Have you reached out to him? I, I, and I want to so bad, man. And I do, but I feel like it. So I was reaching out <laughs> Eight, eight degrees of separation. I would reach out to TJ Thompson, who's also a, a stunt man now. And, and he actually got me into the stunt game with Y5O. Okay. Uh, he used to be the icon promoter, which is where I fought Robbie Lawler and, and yep. Jason Miller. And TJ and I have been very close friends for years. He still very close friends with Monty Cox. So he'll call Monty Cox. who's very close still with Matt and Mark. And so he'll, yep. so I'm getting my information that way. Um, I, I just felt like it was inappropriate to, to all of a sudden after all these years, now he has this accident. Let me reach out now. Okay. It was like, why wasn't I reaching out before? And I, and I feel guilty. I, I really do Ariel. I have a really hard time with this. And this is, this is probably one of the, the bigger mistakes in my life that I wish I could go back five or six years and fix it. Or even when you interviewed us getting ready for the hall of fame, I should have started that relationship then. And I, I just was. Honestly, I was too much of a pussy to do it. I just didn't do it. And I should have started that conversation with, hey, look, let's just talk every every now and again. Let's just, when we're in the same town, let's hang out and sit down and have, and have dinner and have a drink and let's, let's talk because he's got, we disagree on a lot of stuff, right? But we agree on a lot of stuff, but we agree on it in different ways. And it's amazing to talk to a guy that was once your arch rival, your biggest nemesis that, that all of a sudden now you're like, wow, man, like we can we can do some stuff together. We can actually like change the world a little bit. If we talk and, and hang out and do these things. And then the accident happened. I was like immediately reaching for the phone. I got, I got a call. Let me, let me get a hold of Mark and find out what's going on. And I was like, man, it's just inappropriate. So I have not reached out to him. I have not. And it, and it really is one of the greatest disappointments in my life that I have is that I didn't start that relationship. And now, you know, today. It, it, it's too late it for today. me to come back in and, and try to. It's not too late. You know, it's we'll not too that. late. Do it next know, to him today. Just, why not? I don't, I don't know. I just feel, feel, bad. I, feel I don't know. You're right. I mean, you're right. You're right. I'll, do it I today. Will. I will. Actually, I promise you, I, you know, I'll today I'll just reach out to him and say, hey, just, just checking up on you. There um, you go. But I just feel like a dick. I just feel like a dick doing it now. No, you know, it's, it's just, fine. You're not a dick. You're doing great things, Frank. Yeah, you really? say it's fine. What's that? You say it's fine, but it depends That's on what right. he thinks. <laughs> or does he think it's fine? Well, well, we'll find out. There's only one way to find out. Um, Congratulations. This is a great story. Amazing. And uh, I'm, I'm being honest. I saw you on the screen. I was like, holy crap, this really warmed my heart. It was great to see you in there. And I think it's great for the sport that you're doing this. So thank you for doing it um, on behalf of the MMA community. And, and, and I wish you nothing but the best. I hope to see you in every state, every event, every jurisdiction, whatever the case may be. Uh, we need more people like you in there. So thank you for doing this. And thanks for coming on and, and talking about it. It was fantastic. Yeah, my pleasure. I, I love coming on. You know, I told you before, man, I could just, you could just cancel everybody else and you're not going to talk shop for two and a half hours. I wouldn't even care, but I'm totally fine with that. Like, I, I love your show. Thank you. Um, I do love the, the, the information you do put out. I do think sometimes you, you, um, scroll yourself into these weird questions sometimes. And then it takes me like five minutes to figure out why you went that direction. And then the answer comes out. I'm like, Oh, I, okay. That's what he did. All right. I get it. So for the folks at home that don't understand, uh, aerial, only puts out about 3% of all the information he has, 97% of the information he keeps to himself. And so when he's asking these weird ass questions to some of the guests, it's because he already knows the answer. <laughs> and he's, he's squirreling you down this hole because he knows what's going on. And it's, it's great to watch people squirm. It's like, but you already know what the answer is supposed to be. And so they give you the, they give you the wrong answer. You're like, okay, so the follow-up is, and then it's like, now there's really scrambling. And I love that. About, I love that about you. So it's, yeah, yeah. I, did, uh, I definitely am a fan and I'm so happy you brought me back on, man. And, and anytime you want to have me on, I'm definitely down for Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you for revealing my secrets there. Appreciate it. <laughs> it's not a secret, man. Everybody knows. <laughs> Talk to you soon, Frank. All the best. C keep it up. Continued success. Thanks so much, man. Aloha. All right. There he is. Frank Trigg. How about that? What a story. Unbelievable. 500 fights. He's ref 500 fights and no one knew about it.